this second Sunday in Lent, and our theme for today is Hiding from God or Hiding in God. And we begin with our first hymn.
are righteousness and strength. And all who rage against him will come to him and be put to shame. But in the Lord, all the descendants of Israel will be found righteous and will exalt. Here endeth our first reading. In the epistle lesson, the church of Thessalonica was one of St. Paul's favorite congregations. And in motherly affection, he writes, Be holy. This is the purpose and aim of redemption. That is the will of God. Our sanctification is also the purpose of Lenten season and preparing for Easter. So through holy baptism, holy communion, the contemplation of the scriptures, the sermons, all these means are ways that grace is bestowed upon us and how we learn about our Lord's death and resurrection. With God's help, we are inspired to live God-pleasing lives. We need to be reminded that we must be on guard of the old evil foe. The epistle lesson for this, the second Sunday in Lent, is written in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, reading verses 1 through 7. Finally, brothers, we instruct you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body, in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. And that in this manner, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish the man for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Here endeth the epistle, and we join in the gradual. Christ humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. In the gospel lesson, we see the determined effort of the evil spirit to possess and defeat. We also see the faith of the Canaanite woman in her struggle in faith. A faith that would not take no for an answer. It confesses and perseveres. It grows into the mighty power that conquers Christ's seemingly reluctance to help. The Holy Gospel is written in the 15th chapter of St. Matthew, reading verses 21 through 28. Please rise for the reading. Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. <laughs> Jesus did not answer her a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. She keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Here endeth the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise be to thee, o Christ. Let us confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 12. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. By nature, we hide from God. 
We don't want him to know who we really are, but this hiding only results in spiritual and physical disaster. By speaking the truth, it frees us from the burden of self-justification or into thinking that I'm not guilty of sin. Have you ever hidden from God? Psalm 32 was written and prayed by King David. He compares the man who hides from God to the man who hides in God. Like Adam and Eve, like King David himself, like Judas Iscariot, we excel in hiding from God. You and I may be able to walk down the street and convince almost everybody that I'm a perfect Christian because I lead a upright and moral life. But we are often very good at hiding our thoughts and our actions, and for the most part, we can keep our thoughts of hatred or unfaithfulness or jealousy or adultery to ourselves our thoughts of coveting or wishing for something that isn't ours. We can even turn gossip into sounding like real sympathy for whoever happens to be under attack. Yes, we can hide our, our sins very well from others, but hiding from God does not work too well. Dear fellow redeemed, listen again to what happens in our text in verses 3 and 4. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength is dried up as that by the heat of summer. In other words, when we hide our sins from God, it has certain consequences. We hear about others in the coming week, but one of the consequences which we will look at today, and we know very well, is guilt. What is guilt? Guilt is the power and rule of sin in our lives. It eats away at you, and it won't go away. You can try to cover it up with work. Some people use alcohol and drugs or other things that distract us, but guilt will not go away. That's God's law coming to bear on your life. It's uncomfortable. It's painful because it's supposed to be. For remember, God's purpose is to forgive you your sins. But to do that, he has to kill you with his law first. Our old Adam, our sinful nature, just doesn't want to be clean. And the more we try to hide our sin, the more sin is in you and I don't want to God to see our sinfulness. So like the child hiding behind his hands in a hide-and-seek game, we are either afraid or we turn and blame God and make excuses for our sins, thinking that, oh, God won't see our sinfulness. And yet we are miserable. Our sin weighs heavy upon us. It holds us down. We may be able to put a happy face on for a day or an hour or a week, but the guilt is always there. And that brings us back to God's purpose. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Psalm 32.1 we somehow get the crazy idea in our head that God is pleased with us if we cover up our sin. But that's just the opposite. God is pleased when we confess our sins 
So he can do his work of recreating us into his image. God wants to forgive our sins more than anything else in the world. And as we heard from the confirmation students, our sins are already forgiven, whether we know it or even confess them. God lives to confess our sins. He even died to confess so on the cross to forgive us our sins, and as scripture says again, the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. So that brings us to this question, how does God forgive my sins? And that's what Lent is all about. We hear the words from Luther's small catechism, what is the office of the keys? The office of the keys is the special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of the repentant sinner, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. And where is this written? St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20, verse 22 and 23, the Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. God, in his mercy, has given the binding and loosing keys to the gate of heaven, to his church, to forgive sins. In other words, this is the place where God comes to forgive our sins. The sins of the penitent sinner, who are sorry for their sins, who believe in Jesus Christ as their true Savior. And God does this in several ways. He forgives our sins when we hear his preaching, through the hearing of God's word, through the Lord's Supper, through baptism, and through two different kinds of absolution. <coughs> now, remember, the word absolution is simply a word for forgiveness. And these two special ways that God absolves us, absolves us or forgives our sins, one we know very well. The other, again, as a reminder, we may not use at all. First, it is called general confession and absolution. We did that at the beginning of the service. I, a poor, miserable sinner, <coughs> confess unto you all my sins and iniquities. And then I, as your pastor, absolve or forgive your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now remember, it's not me doing that. It is God doing that through me. The second kind of confession and absolution is called individual confession. This is one where many of you may not have ever done it. This is when someone comes to the pastor privately or individually and confesses their sins, sins that are weighing heavy upon them, trouble or torturing them so they can find no rest. They may have specific sins they confess or maybe they aren't specific. Then using the word almost identically, I forgive their sins in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. This is like a hidden treasure in a shoebox. It is a gift of individual confession and absolution, but used very little among Lutherans. Human beings are by nature like that horse or mule. And our psalm said, we don't know what's good for us. Rather than hear God's word of forgiveness, we by nature hide from God and stumble in our sin. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, God seeks you out and he wants nothing more than to forgive you your sins, to release you from pain and hurt that your sins bring to you. As we pray with the psalmist, you are my hiding place for me. You preserve me with trouble, of me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. And as Paul wrote to the Colossians, for you have died, and your life is hidden in Christ, 
with Christ in God. This morning, I pray that you will run to God's mercy. That you confess your sins before Him. Run to Christ Jesus, His holy word of absolution. So that we hide in God and not from God. For God wants us wants to forgive us all our sin more than anything else. He will protect us. He will hold us in the palm of His hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise. <laughs> and now may the peace of God which passes all our understanding keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Lord, as, you, as your prospering hand has blessed us, may we give you our best. And by the deeds of kind love for our neighbor, may your mercy gracefully prove that love which you have shown us through all our days. Praise to God, immortal praise. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who are worthy to be had in reverence by all the children of men, we give thee most humble and hearty praise for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, which without any merit or worthiness on our part thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee especially that thou hast preserved unto us in thy purity, thy saving word and the sacred ordinances of thy house. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace, to grant unto the holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors, who shall preach the word in it with power, and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly believe it. Send forth labors into the harvest to open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy, remember the enemies of thy church and grant them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger. And may we in communion with thy church and in brotherly unity with all our fellow Christians fight the good fight of faith, and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth, especially we entrust thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us, and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. To this end, we commend to thy care all our schools and pray thee to make them nurseries of useful knowledge and Christian virtues, that they may bring forth wholesome fruits of life, graciously defend us from all calamities by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine, protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling, and cause all useful arts to flourish among us. Be thou the God and father of the widow and the fatherless children, the helper of the sick and the needy, the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Accept, we beseech thee, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. And as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to preserve for the world to come Doing the work thou hast given us to do while it is day, before the night cometh when no man can work. And when our last hour shall come, support us by thy power, and receive us into thy everlasting kingdom, through Jesus Christ thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. All this we pray together in the prayer you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace.
preaching and commanding you, but it's just an awesome responsibility. And it's such a good feeling to be able to do that for you. And all of us should think about that. How God has blessed us. The joy we feel. And the thankfulness that we are forgiven sinners. We, we have such a benefit over most of the world, don't we? Who live in their sin and their disgusting lives and don't, don't know where to turn or anything. And we are so blessed to have that. What is the reason, or what's the relationship then in this verse between transgressions forgiven and sins covered? Transgressions forgiven and sins covered. It's basically the same thing, isn't it? It's just another way to say it. So it's basically the same thing. It's the release we have from our sins. So by not asking God for forgiveness, who do we deceive, ourselves or God? Ourselves, don't we? Yeah, yeah. You can answer too. You don't have to be quiet. This is a Bible study, so go ahead and answer. Okay, we look at Psalm thirty-two, three and four. Let's read that together. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was zapped as in the heat of summer. Think about that. How many of us have ever felt that? Those things there that they're talking about. When we have sinned against someone, doesn't it just eat at you? Doesn't you hurt way down to your bones sometimes? Don't you feel like what there's nothing I can do? I'm so worthless. Our strength is zapped. David really used some words there of explanation, doesn't he? So it says, what were David's um, special or physical consequences of keeping silent? Well, his bones groaning. His hand, God's hand was heavy upon him. His strength was zapped. And so why would keeping silent over one's sins have physical consequences? Why does it? Think about guilt. Think about when we have guilt. Why is there physical consequences to our guilt? It's the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? If it if you know the stove is hot and you touch your hand on there, you know what? It's gonna be hot, right? Don't do it, it's gonna be hot. It's the same way when we sin. If we sin, most of us know it's wrong before we do it, right? We do it anyway, because we're sinful, we can't help it. But then we know we have to do something to change that, right? We ask God to forgive us, and He gives us forgiveness. And it's so important to think about that and, and, and listen, because God wants us to forgive, to forgive our sins, and He wants us to do it quickly. Because there's a Bible verse that talks about often it's used in marriage counseling. Don't go to bed. You may remember that. Angry, because what does it do? Anybody remember? It gives Satan a foothold. We go to bed angry against our spouse. How does the morning turn out if you went to bed angry? Not so good. Because now the devil's winning there a little bit. He's going to cause it, but we're going to blame her. We're going to blame him. He's, he's just not forgiven. Right? Just think of all these things that he's done against me. Okay? But if we ask for forgiveness, and men, I know we have to ask for forgiveness sometimes, even though if we don't understand it, but we do it anyway, right? Because that's what God wants us to do. Forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. And when we do that, isn't the morning much better? Hey, even the after results are often better too, right? A little hugging and kissing and all of those things that we love men, right? So we think about that. That's the importance of that verse, isn't it? Because God wants us to forgive and do it quickly. Okay, the next one is Psalm 32, 5 and 6. When I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquities, I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found, 
Surely when the mighty water arrives, they will not reach him. So why are these words so familiar? Well, if you think about it, it's right from the confession is where that comes from. It's quoted in the second part of the confession of sins on page 15. So what does the word confess mean then? What does it mean to confess? First, it's speaking what? The truth about our sins. Okay. And then it's also acknowledging God and what He says about our sins and what He gives us then. What are some things we confess in church? It's more than just sin. What else is it? What, that, what do I say after the readings? After the reading of the gospel? Let us confess our, our Christian faith in the words of creed, right? Creed. It's a confession of faith. So we not only confess our sins, we confess our faith. How else do we do that? Just being here, you're confessing your faith in God. Isn't that something? You did that without even thinking about it. All right, the next one is Psalm 32, 7. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. So what does it mean to hide in God? What does it mean to hide in God? He in His mercy. Right, He in His mercy. Ask God for forgiveness. He forgives us. We hide in His mercy. The devil says to us, what? You miserable person. God will never take you to heaven. And we have God over here saying, He's already forgiven. His page is clean. It's white. It's washed white with my blood. You have nothing to say. Isn't that fun? We can hide in God and He takes care of us. We go to judgment and Jesus says, Wait a minute. This person has a white page. I died for his sins. That's wonderful, isn't it? Okay, so... How does this hiding preserve me then from trouble that surrounds you? Because of the comfort, we know we are forgiven. Nothing. We have nothing to be afraid of, right? We face death, and the devil, and the world and our own sinful flesh all day long. But we don't have to fear that. Because for one thing, Christ defeated death. He gave us salvation. He forgives our sins. And we have a home in heaven waiting. We don't have to fear any of those things. Paul tells us in Colossians and Romans, he describes baptism as our dying to sin and rising in righteousness forever. So baptism then is a covering, isn't it? It's like hiding in Christ. We hide in Christ through baptism and the Lord's Supper. So together now at Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. The language here seems to us David's praying to God, but hear God speak. That isn't part of the Bible for sorry. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, in this part, it's like it's switching, right? So God was, or David was asking all these things, and now all of a sudden it says, I will instruct you. I will teach you. So is the message, is the message God gives to David here? What is the message God gives to David? We don't have to worry, do we? Because when we're in doubt, what is God going to do for us? Teach us, instruct us, counsel us. And watch over us. That's pretty comforting when we think about it. Uh, the next part there is uh, in the catechism. What is the office of the keys? And we read this in the sermon too. What is the office of the keys? Special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of the repentant sinner and withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. So where do we receive the forgiveness of sins according to the catechism? Where do we receive it? Through God's word, right? So through God, the means of grace, the word and the sacrament. And we can find that forgiving idea all through the Bible. Okay? 
How might this forgiveness, how might this forgiveness and withholding of forgiveness relate to what David teaches us about confession and forgiveness? Think about that. What do we feel like when we haven't had our sins forgiven? I don't know about you, but I need to go to church every Sunday or whenever it's possible for me because I need my sins forgiven. And all of us should think that way. Oh, I don't need to go to church today. I'm too tired. Oh, I got stuff to do. Yeah, but our spirit, Joel, says we need God's forgiveness. We need that comfort that we receive there. We need to come and see our fellow Christians who love us the same way that they, we love God, they love God. Fellow sinners that can gather together and worship God and, and how important that is. So, and it says, um, let's see, where is this written? Uh, and that's the part where St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20, Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So, why is it important that sin is actually confessed, that is spoken and acknowledged, instead of simply having people read about it in the Bible? Is there a difference to come here and actually say, I, poor miserable sinner, confess unto you my sins, and then receiving absolution? There should be. It should comfort us, shouldn't it? I mean, we can read the Bible and say, yep, God forgave me, but if we hear it, so there's different kinds of learning, isn't there? There's learning by reading, there's learning by hearing, there's learning by doing. And so all of those things are important. It should give us more comfort and more joy and strength, right? Okay, read together Psalm 32, 10 then. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds a man who trusts in him. So how do we reconcile this verse with the simple fact that God's people suffer many sorrows. <coughs> what are the many sorrows we suffer? Why do we suffer them? What makes them worse? Not asking for forgiveness, right? When we receive forgiveness from it, we feel so much better. And so that the sorrow we speak about is often made worse because of our refusal to recognize it as our sin. Is David saying that if we really trust in God, we won't have sorrow? No. Never. We live in a sinful world. We're going to have sorrow. It doesn't matter. And the last one, why is it important for us to be surrounded by God's steadfast love? What does that do for us? God's love. We talked about it in the Bible study this morning. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Wow, is that ever clear at length? Think of the cross that we have here as a wonderful reminder of what Christ went through for us. And that's because God loves us. It gives us comfort. It gives us strength. It gives us all those things knowing that God has taken care of us. And then finally, God longs to cover our sins with forgiveness. By hiding from Him, we need... Um, we are freed from our own false attempts at self-justification. We are freed to serve our neighbor in love because God has first served us in Jesus Christ. And God surrounds us with that forgiveness. So the accusations of Satan have no power over us. So thank you very much. And